Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 6M, where we're going to make the switch from talking about the personal genomics of humans to talking about how the same genomic technologies can be used to analyze the um, organisms that we care about, in particular livestock and pets. We'll talk about using various forms of genome analysis to confirm identity and parentage of valuable animals, to predict the performance of livestock, to tell which breed our dog is, and what sex our bird is, and some surprising things you might not have thought of. First, identifying parentage. So parentage is extremely important in breeding programs when there's attempts to improve the stock of cattle or sheep or pigs for better meat production or wool production in sheep or in um, competitive things such as horse racing. So we see that now the jockey club which is the register of all the thoroughbred horses, is now typing every photo, every photo that's registered, has its DNA typed to verify who its parents are. And this, they're finding, is far more accurate than the old testing of blood types, and their continuing requirement that the actual mating be observed and recorded in a notebook. DNA typing is also being used in sheep, um, Predicting sheep pedigrees is a little tricky because very often sheep mating is taking place out of sight of the, the shepherd or the livestock manager. And so DNA typing allows the parentage to be accurately determined. SNP typing is now being extended to a lot of other species as well. Um, these are the same kinds of SNP typing chips that are used for human SNP typing, for instance, by 23andMe. And we've got chips for typing cattle um, with lots of SNPs, but only a small number of samples, more samples, fewer SNPs, for typing dogs, for typing ovine is sheep, porcine is pigs, and maize, for you Americans, maize is corn. All of these have very important, commercially extremely important breeding programs and the SNP typing chips help improve the control of what's happening in the breeding program. SNP typing can also be used, or DNA sequencing, to predict performance in some of the same ways that will test humans for particular genetic diseases that we're concerned about. So thoroughbreds aren't just typed to confirm who their parents are, they're also typed to gain clues as to their phenotype. Here, a test that is claimed to predict whether or not a horse will be able to buck ferociously, fiercely enough to be successful in the pro rodeo circuit. Um, here we have a test for Angus cattle to help you determine the, the parentage and the phenotypes of your cattle, providing performance. It says, performance predictions on 16 economically important traits. Pfizer, um, one of the big pharma companies, has a major division of animal health and a subdivision of animal genetics. And in that division, they offer testing for many traits. A trait for the pole gene. Pole cattle are cattle that have no horns. And horns can be removed chemically when the calf is quite young, so the horns don't develop. But that's difficult and expensive and, and stressful to the cattle as well. Instead, it's desirable to breed cattle that are genetically unable to make horns. These genes exist, but making sure that your cattle have the alleles that you want is very important. You can test your animals to see if, they're, if they lack the allele, if they have one copy, they're heterozygous, or if they're homozygous. And this lets you decide how to use them in breeding programs so that you can wind up with a herd that doesn't have horns. There's also a test to determine coat color. Apparently, um, in many cattle markets, black is more desirable. Maybe black Angus. So you can get a genetic test to predict whether your um, cow or bull is going to produce 
some or all black progeny. Um, one of the most interesting to me is a, an allele for a trait called Piedmontese myostatin double muscling. It turns out that a single nucleotide change from a G to an A in a myostatin gene, which controls the production of muscle, this change causes essentially double the amount of muscle to be produced. And it's a natural variation, it's not genetic engineering, but if you want to breed this trait into your cattle, you want to breed animals that are homozygous for the trait so that they will breed true. This is something we'll talk a lot more about in part two of the course. So this is a bit tricky because the allele causing the double muscling, the A version, is dominant. So if the cattle have one allele of this, they have the muscling phenotype, you want to pick out the ones that have the muscling homozygous genotype for your breeding program, and Pfizer will sell you a test that will let you check this. Um, lots of tests are available for all different kinds of animals. Here are tests available for horses. This is a large set of tests testing for harmful alleles that cause diseases. These are particularly important in horses because thoroughbred horses especially are very highly inbred. We'll talk more about inbreeding in Module 9, but it increases the risk of being homozygous for harmful alleles, and that's what this test will help you check for. Another trait that's really important in horses is what they look like. Coat color and pattern, what color the hairs are, and how any patterning, spotting, or dappling is distributed over the horse's body is really important in determining who will buy your horse. And so breeders want to be able to predict accurately what the offspring are going to look like. This test, this set of tests, will let them do that by telling them whether the animal has zero, one, or two copies of an allele causing any particular phenotype. Now, this testing sounds like a big deal, but it's actually pretty cheap. It's a lot cheaper than testing people, presumably because all of the regulatory bodies don't enter into it. So test for cattle, um, oh, this is for sheep, sorry, um, $11 to upgrade to enhanced parentage, $33 for a complete profile. Um, it's really... 825 for a loin max test, whatever that is. These are not very expensive at all. Now, what about pets? Well, one of the main uses for DNA typing in pets is for dogs. Um, many of us have dogs that are mutts. We love our mutts, but they're, you know, crossbred. Who knows who their parents are? But we'd like to think that, oh, my dog is mostly some wonderful breed. Now, you can have your dog's DNA tested using a breed identification SNP typing chip that includes all of the um, polymorphisms that distinguish different breeds of dogs. Here's another company that does this. It's only $60 Canadian to have the test done. What's even more striking is you can have the test done on your dead dog that you don't send them the corpse. What you send them is something your dog has chewed on. That old rope that Bosco always chewed to pieces, it's basically one great big dried up saliva sample. And for $157, you can find out what breeds your no longer alive dog had. This seems a bit over the top, especially when you look at the quality of the data that the DNA typing test provides it's not very high resolution. So this is an example of an analysis. And they say, okay, level one means it's over 75% of particular breed. Level two, this dog, Mousy, is oh, between 37 and 74% lasso apso, so maybe half. And then there's, well, there's a little bit of Boston Terrier and a little bit of Pekingese. It's not very high resolution information. But for some people, it means a lot. 
Now, you can also use DNA testing to determine the sex of your birds. If you've ever had a pet bird, a budgie or a, a parrot in particular, it is really quite difficult to determine what sex they are. Often, um, bird owners don't know the sex of their bird until it lays an egg. Um, but for a simple $20 fee, you can send in a feather from your bird to Avian Biotech and they'll tell you what sex your bird is. Now, I've saved till last my favorite test. This is the one I think shows the most creativity. Um, and this is a company called Poo Prints. And what they do is they offer a service whereby a community where people have dogs, but there are strict rules about cleaning up after your dog, but not everybody is obeying the rules. Poo prints will um, collect samples or let you send them samples of probably saliva samples, um, cheek cell samples from the dogs. They'll type all the dogs. And then whenever you find a little unexpected dog dropping in your lawn, you can send a little swab off to Poo Prints. They'll DNA type it, and they'll tell you which dog it came from so you can find them and charge them for the cost of the analysis. I think that's very clever. So what have we done? We've talked about a very small subset of the many markets for DNA analysis in other species. Um, analysis for breeding programs, um, analysis for phenotypes that matter directly and for phenotypes that matter in breeding programs, um, analysis for pets, mostly driven by people's curiosity about and love of their pet animals. Um, almost all of this is, of course, profit-driven. And it's actually very economical because it's largely unrestricted by legal or ethical issues. There's very little regulation of these tests. Now, coming up next, we're going to, in the last lecture in Module 6, we're going to talk about how DNA analysis can be used in biodiversity and in conservation. I hope to see you there.